So I don't always get around to making a celebratory Halloween video, but I was determined to this year because we don't talk enough horror on this channel for my liking. If you're new here, we talk a lot of romance around these parts because that's very much my chosen genre, but ranked right below it would be the scary stuff. You know, I often hear people describe humor and horror as two sides of the same coin for eliciting the strongest responses of laughter and fright. But as much as I also enjoy comedy, that's how I'd alike in romance and horror. The genres that make me feel the most, and at the end of the day I guess that's what I want out of fiction is to be emotionally impacted by it. On that note, I find Mike Flanagan's work usually speaks to that desire. I think his voice as a filmmaker, especially in the horror space, is uniquely sentimental, which appeals to me, and I'm a longtime fan now. I'd bet most of you know him by name, but even if you don't, you're likely familiar with some of his credits. He's the prolific director behind films like Hush, the Ouija prequel, Doctor Sleep, but in recent years he's been known for the shows he's produced under Netflix, from The Haunting of Hill House to the fall of the house of usher it was as i was mulling over exactly what to cover this october that i stumbled upon a tweet asking we name a favorite of his mini series and it occurred to me that they'd make the perfect subject of my next door ranking so that's what i'm here to do pick and choose but as always allow me a few disclaimers one while i did consider including his movies as well i've arrived at the conclusion not to compare apples and oranges i also like that because he and his collaborators will be working with amazon moving forward there's a sense of finality to the Netflix era. It just seems like the opportune moment to reflect not on his entire career, but a particular portion of it. If you're curious though, my favorite films of his would be The Brilliant Gerald's Game and The Severely Underrated Before I Wait. Two, still on the topic of inclusions and exclusions, I've opted not to include The Midnight Club, which is often categorized differently because Mike Flanagan wasn't its sole creator, but to be fair, he actually directed one more episode of it than he did Blind Manor. All of these shows are, and every show ever is a collaborative effort. What more so differentiates The Midnight Club in my mind is the fact that it was meant to go on past a single season. It's only fair that the series I'll be pitting against each other are all miniature in name and self-contained by design. Three, all eligibility requirements considered, this means I'll only be ranking four projects today, which is a new challenge for me. I mean, on an individual level, I did struggle to decide between Scooby-Doo movies and Cinderella retellings, but with so many options on the table, clear tears emerged. There were entries I hated and versions I loved, but today I truly believe all of the options to be top tier. A compelling argument could be made for any one of them to land first. It begs the question actually, why rank? I could simply review these shows chronologically, but I'm forcing them to compete, not because I expect to do the impossible and really get to the bottom of which one is the best, but because that's more engaging than simply saying I love them all and sending you on your merry way. All I ask is that you keep in mind, I aim only to reveal my preferences and I'd be interested to hear yours as well in the comments section below. Last thing, I forewent reading any of the relevant source material, but to my understanding, Hill House is an extremely loose adaptation of the novel by Shirley Jackson, Lime Manor was inspired by multiple works of Henry James, and House of Usher took a similar approach to the works of Edgar Allan Poe. I of course was already familiar with a few of those poems, and I would have read whatever else had I been working on a dedicated video about just one series. As it stands, however, I'm only here to briefly explain the reasons behind my rankings, but you can find great great comprehensive deep dives elsewhere. In the meantime, still anticipate spoilers ahead. With that, this video is brought to you by Factor. Factor is a chef prepared meal delivery service, which means it's not the kind that drops off ingredients at your door, but instead entire pre-made, never frozen breakfasts, lunches, and dinners that'll be ready in just two minutes or slightly longer if you decide to plate them like a lady. You might remember I've previously worked with Green Chef, which is now owned by the same company, meaning you can enjoy both brands at discounts with my codes, depending on when you're eager to cook or when you'd rather skip that part and get straight to the delicious nutritious food. As a vegetarian myself, I've loved meals like their tomato goat cheese cavatappi primavera and Indian butter tofu. The Factor offers options for all kinds of dietary needs and lifestyles, from gourmet plus to keto. That's not even to mention all of their add-ons like snacks, drinks, and desserts. All in all, I recommend you go to factor75.com or click the link below and use code juliacudney50 to get 50% off of your first Factor box and 20% off of your next month of orders. That's code juliacovney50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. Thanks, Factor. Um, so where are the gays? Where are the gays?
The fall of the House of Usher follows each sibling from the titular family die by the mysterious hands of Averna, an anagram for Raven, until it's revealed that back in the day their father and his twin made a deal with her that in return for riches, rewards, and immunity from the murder they just committed, the Usher bloodline would inevitably die with them. It's the most recent release I'll be covering and I have a relevant confession to make here which is that I actually quoted the aforementioned tweet to say that I was just glad Fall of the House of Usher made it so that I didn't have to rank any of the others last anymore. I do stand by this, but it sounds worse than I mean it. Like, it's definitely true that when there were just three, I never would have made this video if only to avoid labeling Hill House, Bly Manor, or Midnight Mass the worst. And obviously I've made my peace with this outcome, but that doesn't mean I dislike, let alone hate, T-F-O-T- H O U. No, I think it's a smart, well-executed, engaging miniseries. What it didn't manage was to embed itself into my heart and soul the way the others did. I'd say primarily because it tonally set itself apart by being more cynical and comedic, which is maybe a vibe that doesn't play as well to this specific creative strength. Speaking of the similarities between horror and comedy, I have a working theory that there are two types of both, the optimistic and the pessimistic. Now, are these the two types of everything? Yes, but I think like particularly <laughs> horror and comedy. So in the world of sitcoms, that would be the difference between your feel-good Michael Schur variety and shows like It's Always Sunny or Seinfeld, where I'm told the joke is that it follows an unlikable cast of characters. As for scary movies, I'd compare the latter category to franchises like Saw or Final Destination. And while House of Usher certainly takes itself more seriously, can you also see the resemblance? I mean, episode by episode, Usher's die in elaborate ways designed for their particular wrongdoings. This has been confirmed unintentional, but perhaps encouraged by knowing previous Mike Flanagan characters were fashioned after the stages of grief, many viewers found themselves sorting the Usher family members by seven deadly sins. Point is, it's not a likable cast of characters at this show's center, which is cool, but a noteworthy deviation from a shared virtue of the series that preceded it, which would be admittedly flawed yet deeply sympathetic characters. I'm all for trying something new, and I can imagine somebody placing the fall of the House of Usher first precisely because its style better suits their tastes, but speaking for myself, I must admit to being a sappy cornball at heart who usually wants someone to root for, even in this recently popular class of anti-capitalist film and television all about how rich people suck. When life hands you lemons. Make lemonade. No. To be clear, I don't mean that I always want a happy ending. The character you most root for in House of Usher is Roderick's granddaughter, Lenore, and it's for that reason that her undeserved demise is one of the show's most heartbreaking and a flagship moment. Still, I wouldn't call it my favorite death. A story like this gets creative with its kills, and because I intend to let you in on my favorite episode of each series, I'll say that for this one, it's the second, largely thanks to Perry's acid rain orgy, which was so horrifying and a fitting introduction to this freaky, and I don't mean scary, show. To conclude with another positive, I think House of Usher works very well as a showcase for its actors. Across all projects, Mike Flanagan is known for lengthy monologues that I'm sure a lot of performers would love to get their hands on. But this series also offered weirder, wackier roles for its cast. One of the big news items surrounding it was that Bruce Greenwood stepped in as a late game replacement, which you'd never know just by watching it. Down to my head though, as an MTV Scream fan, I'd pick Willa Fitzgerald's as my my standout performance. That a maiden there lived, whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. What's happening? Shh. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> the one and only direct follow-up to Hill House. The Haunting of Bly Manor starts with an American named Danny accepting a position as an au pair for an orphaned brother and sister at a London estate passed down to their uncle. It then sees her bond with the other workers on the property, perhaps even fall in love with one of them. As the children attempt to protect everyone from the self-explanatory lady in the lake, all the while being occasionally possessed by Danny's deceased predecessor and her toxic boyfriend. Knowing deep down 
that I'd save Hill House or Midnight Mass before Bly Manor in a fire has pained me over the years because I am so very fond of it. And despite this placement, I respect anyone who'd place it higher. When I pulled my patrons for their favorite, I was pleasantly surprised by how close it came to taking the lead, but it makes sense. If the people who watch my videos are anything like me, they enjoy a little romance and this one is a love story. You said it was a ghost story. It isn't. No? To love story. In that way, it is probably the most aligned with my usual sensibilities. Among the many other bits and pieces of this show I adore, Danny and Jamie's relationship has stuck with me the most. A romance had never and hasn't since taken me by surprise the way theirs did. Jamie was unceremoniously introduced over halfway through the first episode and I remember being kind of annoyed by that. The gardener did not even introduce herself to the new au pair. The others in the room just assumed they'd already met. Like what, there's a gardener? and she's not even gonna introduce herself. Cut to a few episodes later, I loved her and I wasn't even sure when I'd started. I've since made a lot of lesbian sims inspired by her character overalls, greenhouse and all. That's another of my favorite things about Bly Manor, it's aesthetic. From the mossy statue garden to the foggy lake, from the 80s sweaters to the warm toned color grading, I return to this series as something of a comfort show, which relates to a criticism that came to mind as I was racking my brain for reasons why not all of my top three should tie for first. The Haunting of Bly Manor isn't as scary as The Haunting of Hill House and I want to be very clear about why I say that because this was a popular complaint on social media upon its release and I always hated to hear it. I hated to hear it because the series aimed at a different kind of horror, gothic romance, on purpose. Looking at all four of these shows in the rear view, however, I do have to wonder if Bly Manor would have been a more tonally consistent miniseries had it not been beholden to taking after Hill House. Tell him I love him. And the rest, well, it's just... <laughs> the rest is confetti. What I mean to suggest is that perhaps being the sole successor to a hit series reportedly so scary that it had people throwing up and passing out forced Bly Manor to indulge in a few jump scares and other thrills that weren't necessarily compatible with its still eerie but ultimately sweeter vision and maybe the inconsistency created a false sense of expectation that it should have been the same kind of terrifying as Hill House. On the whole, I would consider myself to be a massive fan of anthologies because when I love something, I want them to do it again, but different, like not a sequel, just again, but different. But because this one turned out to be more of a duology, Bly Manor sticks out for a relative lack of independence compared to the others. If there is another reason why it wound up third, that's simply because the pacing of the climax is a little screwy. The tension builds and builds, but as soon as it peaks, we backtrack into the lengthy origin story of The Lady in the Lake. I enjoy the episode, don't get me wrong. My top spot belongs to Tania Miller's big episode, If You Know, You Know, but the romance of certain old clothes is a worthy adversary, and I'm not sure where else they should have placed it. I just can't help but find it a little silly and goofy how many times we see Danny dragged away in a chokehold before finally continuing into the sequence. None of these nitpicks are really important to me though, and I'm not happy ranking Bly in the lower half. It's my truth, but it makes me sad. You know what you are. See it. If you're interested in the full story of how Midnight Mass went from an unfinished manuscript to an Easter egg to a reality, Mike Flanagan has told it and I'll link that essay below, but even without any additional context, this would be a fairly clockable passion project and I mean that as a compliment. The show is about the religious revival turned bloodbath of a dwindling island populace upon the arrival of a new enigmatic priest and the return of their own Riley Flynn, who's been recently released from a prison sentence for killing someone in a drug driving accident. Only the town's new priest is actually just their new and improved old priest, having been turned into a vampire by the supposed angel that he's brought back in a trunk to serve his congregation its blood in their communion. I mean, he's a mistake, haven't we all? Bless my lord, for I am going to sin. I'd argue this series picks up steam the slowest of the bunch, and besides maybe House of Usher, they all take a moment to rev their engines. I just remember starting Midnight Mass for the first time, feeling like it probably wouldn't be on par with Bly Manor or Hill House in my book. By the time the credits rolled on the final episode, I was sold. Like, oh, 
that was everything to me. I wanted to rewatch it immediately, which is always how I know when I really love something. The last three episodes are particularly strong in my opinion, and it's difficult to choose a champion, but I'll go with the second to last because every time I conjure up the image of everyone killing themselves and each other in the chapel, a lump forms in my throat. I imagine Bev Keen hiding in the back room and rage boils up inside of me. That whole sequence stuck. As someone who was raised Mormon, I often wonder why I'm not a bigger fan of religious horror than I tend to be. And one possible reason is that the subgenre is often less about the practice of a religion and more about its teachings. The object of fear in a lot of Christian horror, to be specific, is Satan himself. Isn't he scary? When I suppose I'm more personally interested in the lived experience of faith-based community, true or untrue, what doctrine means to people and how it impacts them. As such, I'm absolutely obsessed with the use of vampirism as an allegory for religious fanaticism. And before Midnight Mass, it had been a long time since I'd encountered unsexy vampires in the media. Honestly, I'd forgotten they were ever supposed to be threatening, but we're so back, Nosferatu. Basically, this series hit my pressure points. I found its narrative beautifully told and thematically rich, not just anti-fanatic, but also an argument against immortality and a meditation on forgiveness and free will. It's about as subtle as a sledgehammer, but that's true of all of these shows and part of their appeal. Does it sometimes feel as though the characters are trading off monologues? Your turn. What happens when you die? Well, maybe. And despite that being pretty characteristic of this director's work, having to weigh Midnight Mass against Hill House, the fact that some of its scenes do feel slightly less naturalistic is primarily why it's our runner up today. But I hate to say it, I really do appreciate how unapologetically theological it is. And I wouldn't trade in any character's big moment. Thing is, every character in Hill House got a big moment as well. And for the most part, they still came off more organically to me. One explanation as to why might be because even exceedingly minor characters sometimes delivered verbose speeches in that show, which helped to establish a universe wherein people talked like that. Let's move on though before I dive too deep into the next subject. Well, it's nostalgia, but it's nostalgia based on trauma. <laughs> it's a lot about rage and trauma, rage and trauma colliding. Trauma and evil meeting. You know, generational trauma. This is what trauma looks like. The biggest hit on the table, if you've only seen one Mike Flanagan miniseries, it was probably The Haunting of Hill House, but I'll still summarize its premise for the uncultured. The show follows two main timelines with a few odds and ends in between. One in the 90s, which shows off the preternatural experiences of the Crane family during their shortened stint in the titular mansion, and the other upwards of 20 years later when the surviving characters reunite for the funeral of Nell, the youngest sister, whose suspicious suicide is the second of two mysteries at the center of the series, the first being her mother's before hers. All of these shows operate in part as mysteries, and on second thought, that's true of a lot of horror, whether we're talking about a literal whodunit or just anything with a backstory that unravels throughout. But the experience of finishing Hill House in particular for the first time distinctly reminded me of wrapping up a well-crafted mystery. It's not that any one twist or turn was so singularly shocking, but actually the opposite. After each and every revelation, what I couldn't believe was that I hadn't already guessed them, and I don't know about you, but that's exactly how I want to feel. It makes for such a rewarding journey, and I've rewatched Hill House multiple times with other people as a recommendation so that I could vicariously re-experience the reveals through them. The Bent Neck Lady's identity, the truth about the Red Room, but the most iconic twist, and I'm not being facetious, is the fact that Abigail was a real girl all along. <sighs> You're Abigail. See, I told you she was real. I'm sorry. Oops, it was okay. I just love how that toys with our expectations of the genre. Had I been raised in a vacuum with no prior exposure to scary movies or ghost stories, perhaps I would have watched Hill House wondering why nobody believed poor Luke about his evidently real life friend. Beyond shock and awe though, I'm sure that many of you agree that the virtue at the heart of this show's success is the strength of its cast of characters, who like I said, are admittedly flawed yet deeply sympathetic. I mean, I know, 
Stephen has his haters, but in the end, when Nell is saving her siblings one by one and we're reflecting on their stories, their traumas, their damage, I just can't relate to lacking a sense of attachment to this family. Of course, knowing the fun fact that a darker ending was in consideration, I am so happy to be living in the timeline with a little bit of hope at the end of the tunnel for the cranes. Nell's final monologue in the Red Room is one of my favorite moments of dialogue in anything ever of all time. Along with chosen episodes, I was actually planning on picking one line per series that I would theoretically get tattooed on my body, but eventually I realized the only one I'd actually contemplate is the rest is confetti. I've actually considered that. Speaking of though, the easy choice for best episode would be six because of its technical achievement, but because Hill House is already the obvious choice of show, I'm throwing you a curveball and going with the fifth but it's really the one-two punch of episodes five and six. Together, they make the perfect midpoint to the series. Now, since Hill House is officially my top ranked, I'm not obligated to come up with any criticisms of it. Sorry if you were expecting them, but I make the rules around here and you, you've made it to the end of the video. Send me a like on your way out. Comment your most anticipated of Mike Flanagan's billion upcoming projects. Bye. Happy Halloween.